Hey listeners, just a quick note before this episode starts about keeping us honest here at the Mad Scientist Podcast. In the last episode on vampires, we actually mentioned the story of Lilith and said that she was part of a story of her being the first wife of Adam. We actually had a listener email in who knew quite a bit about Jewish mystical traditions, Isaac Vizas, and he said that Lilith is actually more of a Jewish monster and barely present in Catholicism, with the first wife of Adam origin story being more of a modern tradition but probably coming from older Jewish mystical traditions. So, Isaac, thank you so much for messaging us and letting us know. And listeners, if you ever find something that we say on the show that does not fit with what you believe to be true, or what you can prove to be true, please email us so we can let everyone else know. Thank you so much again for listening, and let's get on to the show. Hello, listeners, and welcome to episode 29 of the Mad Scientist Podcast. This week, we're going to be jumping right back into the Betty and Barney Hill case, looking at the evidence of this case from both sides, and discussing each of the major theories about this case in turn. In many ways, what I think about this case is something of a moot point, since like in any scenario where someone is teaching someone else about a topic, it's up to the listener to decide based on the evidence provided. Now, I can't possibly hope to cover every possible angle and bit of evidence that's out there for this case including the huge preponderance of similar experiences that people have claimed to have had since the Hills first made it onto the scene. However, we'll look at this particular case in as deep detail as we can. So strap on your Zeta Reticuli issue jumpsuit, count to three, and sleep at the sound of my voice on this week's episode. Welcome to the Mad Scientist Podcast, episode 29, Betty and Barney Hill, part two. Last time we left off with the Hill story becoming an international sensation, leading to others coming forward with their own abduction claims and becoming a pretty integral part of the UFO mythos. At the same time, however, the Hills themselves would eventually come to be viewed as something of a problem for the UFO community, with Betty Hill in particular becoming ridiculed towards the end of her life for being what some would consider a true believer, the sort who doesn't look at the evidence fully before making a decision, nor testing against rational hypotheses first given her own experience. And the Hill's story became quite morphed over time, from the almost pleasant experience Betty related of calling the nearly human aliens down to Earth, chatting with them peacefully and pleasantly in the ship after their tests, and wishing in some ways for them to return to the modern view of the abduction phenomenon as something closer to what Barney Hill claimed to experience. The modern notion of alien abduction is a very negative experience where an individual is taken against their will, despite their great hesitation and fear, sexually molested, and repeatedly terrorized throughout their lives by cold, unfeeling beings with large black eyes and short, thin bodies is not what the Hills experienced by any stretch of the imagination, even given the negative feelings Barney showed about it afterwards. This in many ways places the Hills experience as a sort of focal point, between the end of the benevolent Space Brothers phase of UFO lore and the mechanical scientists phase, as I like to call it. To many people, the simple bulk of reports of alien abductions or UFO encounters validates the experience as something real, something that is worthy of investigation by modern science. And I would argue that for me personally, this argument is compelling. I mean, hell, I wouldn't be doing this show if I didn't think there was at least something to investigate and understand here. But that says nothing about the veracity or truth of these experiences. I think a pretty interesting quote on this comes from an essay which is part of the collection Science and the Paranormal. This is part of a foreword on an essay on UFOs by Philip J. Class. It says, quote, Just for the sake of argument, consider the following hypothetical situation. Imagine for a moment that UFOs are not real, that our planet has not been visited by strange spacecraft of extraterrestrial origin. Imagine also that there has nevertheless been extensive media coverage of the possibility of UFOs in this planet, so that large numbers of people have come to believe in or at least hope for, the actual existence of extraterrestrial space vehicles. Finally, imagine that the human perceptual system is such that it can play wild tricks on us under conditions of darkness, isolation, fatigue, or unusual stimulation. How many false UFO sightings would we expect under such a hypothetical set of circumstances? A reasonable answer is that we would expect a very large number of false sightings, perhaps equal to the number of reports we are currently experiencing. Now simply change the first assumption above, leaving the others intact, 
and assume that we have in fact occasionally been visited by extraterrestrial spacecraft, which have deliberately been highly elusive. How would the totality of UFO sightings, which now would include some few genuine eyewitness accounts, differ under this latter set of assumptions from the sightings under the first set? This is the essential problem that Philip J. Class addresses. His argument is that it would be nearly impossible to tell the difference. Given the human propensity for perceptual error, the present media encouragement of UFO speculation, and the often demonstrably careless and biased methods of investigation by UFO proponents, class concludes, we do not at present have any reasonable basis for distinguishing a genuine extraterrestrial UFO presence among all the ringers. We cannot go back in time to thoroughly investigate a UFO sighting. We cannot recreate the exact circumstances. We may never know for certain whether a sighting was accurately reported, or whether the account contains perceptual errors, misinterpreted phenomena, biased reporting, or biased investigation. Since we can reasonably assume that many false sightings do occur, and since, as class has shown here and elsewhere, careful investigation generally seems to result in plausible alternative explanations, a belief in UFOs as intelligent visitors from space has to be on very tenuous grounds, not totally denied, but at least not supported by hard evidence. Now, I find that to be a very compelling argument. If UFOs are real, or if they're not real, we should still expect a huge amount of false reports. And so, I don't want to make it seem, based on whatever, my general misgivings about many of the most famous cases of UFO abduction, that that is to be taken to mean that I do not believe that this is possible or occurring currently. I frankly don't know. And I think that's probably the best best answer really that we can give currently. Something seems to be occurring to these people. They seem to think that they have been abducted in some way or had some contact with UFOs. And whether or not that's truly happening or it's a psychological phenomenon or it's something else entirely, it's still worth getting to the bottom of it because it's quite an interesting question. Okay, so the huge amount of reports in no way, at least in my viewpoint, removes the chance of falsehood or mistake from this report, even if it is one of the most famous UFO cases of all time. I think we can, as a starting point at least, discount the notion that the Hills were simply trying to obtain fame or fortune from this story. Initially, they only told close relatives and a handful of friends, and Barney was completely against discussing or recalling the event if he could help it, as we talked about last time. They made some reports to the military through Pease Air Force Base, and that was really what triggered their discussions with further investigators. And they only went to hypnosis when it became apparent that this event that occurred to them, whether real or imaginary, was the source of significant anxiety for them both, through Betty's nightmares and Barney's waking symptoms. And as far as we know, their case only became public knowledge due to someone recording an event where they recounted their experience for a group of UFO enthusiasts at a local gathering of their amateur research group in Quincy, Massachusetts. Which on its face may seem to make it clear that they were trying to gain notoriety by talking about this thing in public, but which I think was meant to be somewhat therapeutic for them. Again, Barney didn't want to talk about this event because it produced cognitive dissonance in his worldview causing him to accept the fact that things were out there that didn't fit into his rational, scientific sort of view, while Betty immediately after the event attempted to find as much information as she could about flying saucers. I can relate to both of them on this in many ways, and don't know how I would respond if I found myself missing time after seeing something I couldn't explain on the highway late at night, let alone if it was with another person who also couldn't remember that event. But I do think I would try to find out as much as I could, and try to determine just what happened to me by looking at all possibilities. That being said, I do think Betty had made up her own mind that this was a UFO-related event even before the amnesia itself occurred. Just from Barney's recall of the event and her own claims about calling down to the craft, and in many ways being excited of the possibility of seeing a UFO or meeting with its inhabitants. Well, what evidence is there that something strange took place? Obviously, we have the word of the hills, 
which I think can't be discounted entirely. However, people's memories about even non-traumatic events are notoriously flawed and pretty easy to shape by later memories or events. One good thing is that the Hills told the story pretty quickly after their initial encounter with each other and with some friends. Although the confirmation that what they recalled later was exactly what they recalled at the time is somewhat tricky to prove. We have the hypnosis sessions, which I think are weaker evidence than conscious recall for a number of reasons that we'll get into. And we have Betty's written account of her dreams about the events. There is, of course, the amnesia itself, which seems to have occurred to both Betty and Barney Hill based on their testimony, and which seems to have lifted upon hypnosis. And there is some physical evidence as well. The Hills claim to have had physical testing done to them, which resulted in Barney having some strange physical effects after the fact. There's also Betty's dress, which was ripped during the trip, Barney's shoes that were scuffed, and the strange circles on the car's trunk that supposedly reacted to a compass as if some magnetic anomaly existed near them. And finally, a piece of evidence that is quite interesting, a recalled version of the star map the leader showed Betty while she was in the craft, which was brought out of her memory via hypnosis. Let's start with the first thing that really tipped the hills off that something strange had happened to them. The physical evidence they claimed to have seen. In this list, I would include the torn binocular strap, the scuffed shoes and ripped dress, the broken watches, and the magnetic circles on the car. How can science explain those details? Well, the shoes and the dress I don't think really can be explained scientifically. Unless, of course, we assume that the hills in some kind of dreamlike stupor destroyed the objects themselves for some reason. Then again, since we don't know what the items were like before the trip, it's impossible to say that they were definitely distorted in exactly the way that the hills claimed during this trip. The same can really be said for the magnetic circles on the hood of the car. Since no one has ever really claimed to have seen these circles besides the hills, and they were said to have simply washed away after the next rainfall. These are interesting though, because what could have possibly caused these sort of magnetic anomalies in the first place? Magnetism stems from the atomic structure of a material, where the quantum spin state of the electrons in the structure become aligned all in one direction, creating a net magnetic field. Basically, you can imagine that each electron in an atom has its own small magnetic field due to its constantly being in motion, particularly due to its spin motion and its momentum. When these magnetic fields go against one another, so in other words, have equal magnitude but opposite direction, then you end up with a net zero magnetic field, and no magnetism for the bulk material. On the other hand, in some materials these smaller magnetic fields align naturally creating a permanent magnet such as those holding up my drawings currently on our fridge. These permanent magnets are known as ferromagnetic materials. Now, in some materials known as paramagnetic materials, you can also induce magnetism. For instance, by applying an electric charge or magnetic field to the material, forcing the electrons to align magnetically for a period of time. You can also create magnetic fields by temperature, or pressure changes to induce changes in the crystal structure, or even by heating up or cooling the material to remove defects that would normally stop magnetism. This is for example how superconductors work, with cooling of the superconductor removing the electrical resistance or amount of energy loss transferring electricity through the material, resulting in extremely high attainable magnetic fields. In theory, if the hills are telling the truth about this magnetic shift of their car's hood, then it would have had to have been an induced magnetic transition. In other words, a change from the hood being normally non-magnetic to magnetic. As far as I can tell, the Hills drove a 1957 Chevy Bel Air, a beautiful car, which had a steel body. You can induce short-term magnetism on steel by basically applying a magnetic field to it for some time. So potentially, I guess it would be possible for the alien encounter to have applied magnetism to their car. Assuming that they use some kind of weird electromagnetic field of some sort to slow the car down or something. But why would they? The Hills claim that the aliens got out of their ship and stepped in front of their car to stop them. As opposed to the sort of usual abduction scenario we now hear about where people hear noises or see a flash of light while driving. Now, maybe the magnetism was some secondary effect of some kind of weird beam or something that the aliens applied to their car. I guess that's possible. But again, it would only be induced magnetism, since they didn't notice the car's body changing or becoming damaged in any way. 
something that we would expect if a phase transition from a non-magnetic alloy to a magnetic crystal would occur, for example. And since, again, we have no evidence for these circles besides the Hill's claims, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense given what we currently know about the way magnets work that this would have occurred. As for radiation inducing this sort of magnetic shift, that would only occur due to a change in the crystallinity of the material, which again would likely result in damage to the car's hood. The magnetic field theory does hold some water, however, because their watches were supposedly damaged after their encounter something that could be caused by a magnetic field messing with some of the internal components of the watch, and which would not really make a lot of sense otherwise. All in all then, the physical evidence for this case isn't exactly a slam dunk for Team Aliens, but it's also not great for Team Rational Scientific Explanation. Now, there is another piece of physical evidence here that is pretty awkward and kind of silly, but supposedly did actually happen. Now. I'm going to tell you, dear listeners, do not Google this at work like I did, because you may get in trouble. Barney Hill claimed that after the encounter, he noticed that his penis had a ring of pimples almost around it in like a perfect circle. He didn't say where they were, but he said he had them. Now, this is known, actually as pearly penile papules, or pearly penile papules, or by its scientific name, hirsutes coronae glandis. And basically what they are is like a circle of almost like little fringes off the head of the penis. And it's thought that these might be vestigial remnants of um, penile spines, which other primates have, but we don't anymore. Now, that seems to occur more often on younger men and more often on those who have not been circumcised and can occur between 8 to 48% of all men. So it can be quite high. Now, it has nothing to do with kind of like an STD or anything like that, but I think that's probably what occurred to Barney Hill. He was probably too embarrassed to go get it checked out. I think he might have actually had them removed potentially, but he believed that this occurred due to the aliens putting a cup like protuberance kind of thing onto his penis as he was being examined. Maybe I don't know why the aliens would have done that. I don't know what the aliens could have done to have caused these things to form, but anyways, it is part of the lore of this story. It is often brought up. And it's a pretty weird piece of evidence. All right. Well, how can we explain the missing chunk of time that they experienced? The true believers will tell you that the hills were completely awake and alert while driving that night, and so could not have possibly fallen asleep during this event. But you don't need to fall asleep to dream or hallucinate while tired, or even to have been driving on autopilot a sort of mode of attentionless driving that I'm sure many of you listeners have experienced, as have I, on long trips. This is known as highway hypnosis, or autopilot, a mode of action where because your brain is doing a monotonous or boring task, time seems to move more quickly in your recall, and your brain may filter out significantly more information than it would normally do while alert and active. There's scientific evidence to back up these anecdotal claims. This phenomenon is known as a period of microsleep, a state wherein some portion of your brain shows reduced activity or near sleep-like patterns while even you are awake and by all other factors alert and fine. Researchers at the University of Wisconsin at Madison showed that this occurred in the brains of rats who had been sleep deprived even while awake and performing tasks, causing them to make mistakes. This is what is occurring in your brain while zoning out. The brain is turning off certain portions to rest while others remain awake, causing you to miss things you should be sensing such as noises or even visual cues. For instance, in cases where someone is seemingly awake while driving, but then runs a red light without realizing it, or misses a turn, or can even drift into oncoming traffic, you're not asleep per se. Instead, your brain is just going on autopilot, assuming that things will remain the same as they have been so that it can catch a few quick moments of respite. 
This scenario has been the focus of researchers trying to determine the effect of continued loss of sleep on people such as bus drivers or train conductors, and become a focal point in the discussion about Amtrak crashes occurring due to conductor tiredness. I think it's very possible that the Hills, after a day spent in Montreal until the evening, made the decision to drive and potentially went into this sort of microsleep state while on a boring and dark road in the mountain valleys of New Hampshire. This isn't to say that the entire event was hallucinated, or even made up, but I think a very strong case can be made that microsleep may at least account for the missing time they seemed to experience while driving home. By all accounts, the Hills themselves didn't even seem to realize the missing time was of any significance until it was pointed out to them in their discussion of the event. Alright, so the Hills are driving home. They spend a day in Montreal, and decide to leave towards the late afternoon, early evening. The trip from Montreal back to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, driving at a brisk 65 miles per hour on these backcountry roads, will take around five and a half hours with today's infrastructure. Based on their own accounts, they stopped for a bite to eat in Colebrook, New Hampshire, and left at around 10 p.m. at night. Barney remarked to his wife that he would expect them to arrive home by 2.30 to 3 a.m. in the morning given their expected trip time from Colbert to their home in Portsmouth as five hours. They stopped at three points to observe the craft as far as I can tell from the various sources on the event. First at a pull-off point near the Mount Cleveland Scenic Picnic Area, next near a pull-off by the Old Man in the Mountain Viewing Area, and finally south of Indian Head, near where the Whale's Tail Water Park stands now, where Barney saw the beings and was stood transfixed in his telling. Let's say each of those stops took between 10 and 30 minutes then that already accounts for an hour and a half maximum of time that they're missing. They then claim to have arrived home near dawn, finally pulling into their driveway at full sunrise. Well, what time was sunrise that day? Pulling up some online sunrise or sunset calculators I found, the agreed upon time for twilight that morning was 5.58 a.m., while full sunrise was at 6.26 a.m. In the interrupted journey, their arrival time is described as follows, quote, just outside Portsmouth, they noticed dawn streaking the sky in the east. As they drove through the streets of the slumbering city, no one was stirring. The birds were already chattering, though, and it was nearly full daylight when they reached home. End quote. So, I think it's safe to say that they arrived at Portsmouth sometime between 5.30 and 6.30 a.m., with birds generally beginning to chirp sometime in the region of 4 a.m. to dawn. So how much time did they really lose? Initially, Barney said he expected they would get home around 3 a.m. from Colebrook, New Hampshire. So let's take that as their expected arrival time. That gives them somewhere in the region of two to three hours of lost time. Okay, well how much of that time could have been lost just looking at the craft? Well, if each stop to look at the craft took around a half hour as we said before, that moves their arrival time home to 4.30. Now let's say that they spent around 20 to 30 minutes driving around slowly to look for this craft, and suddenly we're getting mighty close to them arriving home between 5 and 5.30, with the sun streaking the sky and the birds chirping. In the most charitable telling of the event from the hill's point of view, let's say they spent 10 minutes each time looking at this craft, and only an extra 10 minutes driving around slowly looking for the thing. That still adds 40 minutes to their trip which they likely didn't account for when they arrived home making their lost time between one and two hours. Probably enough time to be harassed by some aliens, but the math here can be stretched without too many unreasonable assumptions to fit this narrative pretty well. So, let's say that the Hills did misplace some of their time just by looking at this thing and being freaked out by it. Just what was it that they were looking at in the sky? This is actually one of my favorite theories on this case and it's one that I only really found discussed in any serious way on a single website, nielsenhayden.com, in an article called Making Light. Now, the author claims that what the Hills actually saw were a series of different lights throughout the mountainsides that someone who's not from the region may not be familiar with, such as fire stations, ski lift tramways, and other random lights present along these darkened areas. I think one of the strongest parts of this theory is that it is extremely easy to lose size, perspective, and movement compared to other items when they're all along a very dark background, and particularly when it is very difficult to tell the difference between the night sky and the dark, forested mountains of the New Hampshire countryside. This theory, along with the hills potentially going into periods of microsleep during their voyage, provides likely the best skeptical explanation for what the hills saw that night, 
while still allowing that they genuinely believed that what they saw and experienced was an encounter with a UFO and the beings piloting it. Just imagine, for example, you're driving home after a long weekend trip that has primarily been driving through the countryside. You find that your mind is foggy, foggier than you expected when you left that restaurant in Colebrook, but you're almost home. As you keep moving, you find yourself feeling sort of odd, maybe having a hard time focusing on the task of driving, sort of staring off into space as you drive, just wanting to get home and get into bed. During one of these periods, you're jolted out of your thoughts because your wife says that she has been seeing strange lights in the sky along the way, one of which she now claims is following your car. You see it out of the corner of your eye as you drive, getting random glances of lights flashing in and out of your view at the side windows, and you're becoming pretty frightened. Over the next hour, your fear rises considerably. As at each stop on the road, you see an object that appears to have windows moving about in your binoculars' views, but occasionally coming to a stop. Finally, at the last place you stop, your heart racing, you manage to get a good view of this thing through the binoculars, and it appears to have windows. You become extremely frightened, run back to the car, and pull away screaming. But when you arrive home, you find that the entire trip from Colebrook to near Concord is a blur with you only half remembering the events as they happened. And you don't really remember, not really, until you talk it over with your wife, piecing together what occurred on that trip that morning after you finally had a chance to sleep. I don't think that this scenario is unlikely or impossible. And for me at least, it's the strongest case to be made for the event itself being imagined. Putting this microsleep phenomenon together with Betty's previous knowledge and closeness to the UFO phenomena due to her sister's sighting, and suddenly you have a scenario where Barney is foggy, tired, and only partially waking up to his wife's insistence that what they're seeing really is a UFO. I myself have been fooled in these same mountains, seeing a light that looks to be following my car only to realize that it's a stationary light that only appeared to be moving and getting closer due to tricks of perception of this light against the darkness of the forest, trees, and mountains. One thing that may even further hint to this scenario is the fact that Betty was quite worried about radiation when she gets home, making Barney keep the luggage out of the main part of the house, throwing away any food that was in the car during their encounter, and ensuring that they both took showers. And although Betty claims that she didn't realize that it was due to her fear of radiation until she discussed the matter with her sister on the phone, and she was an educated woman who lived through the atomic scares of the time, as well as the deployment of the nuclear bombs in World War II, just why would she jump to this conclusion if she had no prior knowledge of the UFO phenomena before this encounter? To me, this suggests, at the least, a passing knowledge of these sorts of events, perhaps from popular culture or perhaps from an interest that began with her sister's supposed UFO sighting. Regardless, I think this shows that Betty at least was not a complete novice to this idea, and could very well have had influences she may not have realized shaping the event. This now takes us to the hypnosis sessions themselves. Interestingly, the person who conducted these hypnosis sessions, Dr. Simon, believed at the end that the recalled memories the Hills seemed to have had were caused by Betty's dreams after the event, and not by some actual physical encounter with aliens. And I think there is a lot of validity to this point, potentially. Let's start by thinking about who encountered what in this event. Betty claimed to have only seen the thing from the car, at some distance, with her only close observation occurring through binoculars. The only person to claim to get a really good look at this thing was Barney, who got close enough supposedly to see humanoid figures staring at him through these windows, but who only really remembered to this point after the event in discussing it with others. Dr. Simon's hypothesis was that Betty's insistence that this was a UFO helped to shape and color the memories of Barney, who in my opinion was likely suffering from microsleep, even if he didn't realize it, as most of us are while driving too late at night. By the two of them discussing the event further and with friends, details became blurred mixed together as they often do when two people recall an event that happened to both of them but which was charged with emotion and adrenaline. Betty's dreams further colored the event, with Barney hearing about them through conversations Betty had in the room with him there, 
in which they both reveal during the cognizant part of the hypnosis sessions with Dr. Simon. This resulted in Barney inserting these figures into his memory and recalling them during hypnosis. I think another thing that makes some sense in this context is just the difference in how they experienced the UFO event itself and the supposed abduction. Betty felt that this thing was a positive experience. She wanted the beings to come back, and she supposedly just had a friendly chat with them on the ship. Barney, on the other hand, was nearly raped by these beings. He doesn't remember it being positive, and in fact is extremely frightened by the event. Why could that be so different? Well, I think it probably has to do with their own social status, their own feelings about the way that they express themselves to others in their society, may have had a lot to do with that. Betty herself was generally open to new experiences. They even talk about this in The Interrupted Journey when describing her past. Barney, on the other hand, was pretty closed up. He was quite anxious, and he was worried about the way that other people saw him, especially being a black man with a white wife in the 1960s in America. I think that Barney's service during World War II as well as his probably negative experience with authority figures throughout his life, caused him to view these aliens as a threat and as something scary. And I think that the fact that their experiences with the aliens was just so drastically different can point to us that this event is being shaped by their own perception and therefore is likely not an exact retelling of what occurred. Hypnosis results generally can be quite difficult to interpret anyways. We are going to do a much fuller episode on the use of hypnosis for therapy and analysis of past memories. However, some general issues can be pointed out here. First off, the use of hypnosis in recent years has fallen out of vogue in the psychiatric community, with the American Medical Association actually putting out a warning against its use for recalling memories in 1985. We'll put a link to this up on the website. However, the abstract of that paper reads as follows, quote, The council finds that recollections obtained during hypnosis can involve confabulations and pseudo-memories, and not only fail to be more accurate, but actually appear to be less reliable than non-hypnotic recall. The use of hypnosis with witnesses and victims may have serious consequences for the legal process when testimony is based on material that is elicited from a witness who has been hypnotized for the purposes of refreshing recollection, end quote. In other words, memories recalled during hypnosis are less reliable than non-hypnotic memory recall. And in fact, the making up or combination of memories with opinions and thoughts about an event can result in the creation of false memories. Now, this isn't to say that hypnosis can't be a useful tool in some forms of therapy. Merely that the reality of the memories recalled must be highly suspect because hypnosis in many ways makes false memories more likely than real ones. But this is basically what Dr. Simon said at the time anyways, and attempted to be careful with the Hills in explaining that what they recalled would not necessarily be the truth, but rather confronting this period of missing time may be useful in their recovery from anxiety. It is the Hills, however, who decided that what they seemed to recall during hypnosis was absolute fact. Now, even if you don't buy the whole idea of the dreams themselves coloring the hypnosis sessions, there are problems with both of their recalls of hypnosis. Betty's memories contain items that are not in Barney's, while Barney's contain some that were not part of Betty's, plus the general view of the whole thing as we discussed earlier. For example, Barney claimed to have been tested on sexually while Betty was not. Barney claimed the being almost spoke to him telepathically, while Betty claimed they seemed to speak to her in English. Betty claimed that she remembered being dragged to the craft and fighting off their hypnosis, while Barney didn't. And Betty claimed that the aliens absolutely loved Barney's dentures, while he didn't recall this at all. The aliens also seem to ask a lot of very simple questions. Things you would imagine an alien species capable of getting here and speaking our language could have figured out without needing to pick up a couple on their way home from vacation. For instance, they didn't know what vegetables were. They didn't understand what time was. Although, as an aside, this seems to be a common thing amongst UFO cases of the time and they didn't know very basic things about our anatomy. All things that they could have learned in books, which are a lot easier to abduct than people, and very rarely tell the tale afterwards. There are other versions of the same general scenario that could be posited. 
For instance, the Hills are using this event to hide some traumatic memory that really did occur on their trip. Or they're simply making it all up. Whatever. The Hills aren't around to defend themselves anymore. And this sort of hypothesis can, of course, always be posited by absolute skeptics who refuse these cases out of hand. I do think, personally, that the Hills absolutely saw something scary that night while driving home. Although whether or not that thing was a UFO is something we will never truly be able to know. But there's enough wiggle room here for a very strong skeptical argument to be made. Both that the hypnosis was mistaken, as Dr. Simon had suggested at the time, and that the sightings themselves were a case of mistaken identity. But probably one of the most compelling pieces of evidence for many in the UFO community is the star map that Betty drew during one of her hypnosis sessions. Betty had claimed that this map was a recreation of the one that the leader had shown her on the ship. And so, to many, the fact that this star map exists was pretty compelling at the time. It was actually initially published in The Interrupted Journey. And then a few years after the publication of that book, an amateur astronomer and school teacher, Mrs. Marjorie Fish, attempted to decipher the star map that Betty had made. She found that the map matched the Zeta Reticuli system, something that many in the UFO field now claim to be the smoking gun for this being a legitimate event. And part of why they think that this is such a slam dunk piece of evidence is the fact that they believe that the Zeta Reticuli system hadn't been described until after Betty's initial encounter. But that's just not true. This star system was first published about in like the 1890s, and it isn't that Betty even would have had access to these records in the first place anyways, so who cares when it was published? Anyways, Fish then sent the star map analysis to Walter Webb, the astronomer who had first analyzed the Hills case for the government, and who then sent it in to the editor of the magazine Astronomy. The map was then actually published in Astronomy, along with info on the case, with the editors asking the public readership for their opinion. This set off a firestorm, with loads of people writing in, in both support and attack of the map itself and the UFO case, including many famous astronomers like Carl Sagan. What's really quite interesting about this argument for the star map, and in many ways similar arguments about the placement of the pyramids, is that because the stars are so numerous and so randomly placed, and because the size of the map versus the size of the stars they're supposed to fit to can be altered at random, you can fit the star map, or really any random number of points, to any area of sky if you try hard enough. It's sort of the same argument with the astrological symbols themselves, right? Like, Cancer doesn't actually look anything like a crab. Leo doesn't look like a lion. It's all just random stars connected together to sort of, kind of, make a shape. And since you can pick any stars in the sky to start from, and pick and choose random ones to add to the pattern, you can very easily match the star chart pattern to any random assortment of stars, or points on a map for that matter. There is a little bit more weight given to this because the aliens supposedly said that they came from a two-star system, and the point of stars that Marjorie Fish chose here is in fact a two-star system. But again, there are just so many two-star systems that it would not be completely impossible to pick these out on a map. And what I mean by a two-star system, by the way, is, is two sun. There are two suns in the system that she chose. One of my favorite versions of this star map overlaid is on top of a map of the New England area, showing that it actually perfectly lines up with Boston, Concord, Albany, Portsmouth, and a number of other towns in the general area going up to Niagara Falls. Seriously, give it a try with a detailed map of your own area, and I bet we'll find that aliens are a lot closer than we give them credit for. Okay, so the Betty and Barney Hill case is, I think, given a lot more credit in the UFO community than it maybe should be. This is not the slam dunk that we want, but it still raises all kinds of weird questions. I mean, if the Hills didn't see a UFO that night, isn't that almost scarier? Since it means it could happen to any of us, at almost any time, when we're driving along at a quiet road. We could, tomorrow, be driving home, only to realize later that we don't really remember what happened can't explain some cuts or bruises on our bodies or clothes, and maybe we'll never know for sure what happened in those intervening moments. 
The fact that the brain can so randomly and easily make us completely question our own sense of what's real or isn't is to me almost scarier than the idea that it's an outside but sensible force out there in the universe. And the fact is that we can't really discount this story anyways, let alone the tens of thousands of cases reported to UFO organizations since this first case. Is something out there taking us from our beds at night to perform experiments? Or are our minds playing tricks on us while we slip between sleeping and awake? Scarily enough, we may never know the answers to which of those is true. However, we do know that there are those out there who claim to have been abducted. And getting to the bottom of what is happening to them is an important matter that should be taken up by science, in my humble opinion. Alright, that's it for this week's episode and the final part of the Betty and Barney Hill case. Now, luckily for you, this episode came out two days to one and a half day late, depending on when you normally expect these episodes to drop. They usually do drop sometime between Wednesday night and Thursday morning. So we're a little bit late this time. And as an I'm sorry to you, my listeners, I am actually about to record another episode on aliens with TJ Cunahan from the Pints and Puzzles podcast, which just started its second season. Please go listen to TJ's show and get ready for a double dose of the mad scientist right now. Thank you again so much for listening. This episode would not be possible without the help of our patrons, those of you that subscribe and rate us on iTunes, and just go about telling your friends about this show that you like. Thank you so much again. A special shout out this episode to Terry, our latest patron, whose generosity is mind blowing. Thank you so, so much. All right. Until next time, thanks for listening.